Welcome to the Medical Menemist Podcast, your source for memory techniques and accelerated learning in higher education. Now, here's your host, Chase DeMarco. Today, we're joined by Lynn Kelly, who holds interdisciplinary array of degrees and is a multiple winner of the Senior Memory Championship in Australia. She has studied Australian Aboriginal tribes, Native Americans, Pacific and African cultures, and their oral traditions for the memory methods used in each. She has discussed many of these topics in her book, The Memory Code, and more recently, Memory Craft, as well as several other books and publications. Lynn, it's great to have you on the show today. Thanks, Chase. It's wonderful to be here. I know I summed it up as an interdisciplinary array of degrees, and I figured it's just easier to maybe have you explain that a little bit more. What, how'd you get to the stage you're at, and, and what degrees do you have? It's very confusing, but it's simple to me. I started in engineering mainly because way back, I'm 67 now, so and memory systems still work really well when you're old. I loved physics and maths because I couldn't remember anything, so I couldn't do any humanities. And when I got to uni, they told me that I couldn't do engineering because I'm a girl, so I went and did engineering. So that was my first degree. Then I did education, taught lots of physics, maths, then did postgraduate information technology. And a lot of these ideas come from looking at things in terms of information technology. And then I did a PhD in interdisciplinary in the arts program, looking at oral tradition and memory methods and the application to archaeology. I love it. I think the interdisciplinary approach is invaluable. It's what I'm trying to do with like a psychology and medical and education background working towards this podcast to kind of rope them all in together and make it as useful as possible. It's a problem if you want an academic career because you don't fit anywhere. The advantage of doing a PhD as an old person, uh, 67 is actually not all that old. Not at all. But compared to med students, it usually is. Uh, I didn't have any of those problems. I had the freedom to follow radical ideas because I wasn't trying to get into a career. I had one in education. (laughs) (laughs) It seems to have worked out quite well for you with all of the books and all the studies you've been able to to publish and discover. And I love your theory on Stonehenge that I was just listening to before this podcast. Actually, if you don't mind explaining that a little bit more, how Stonehenge is possibly a memory palace from your academic point of view. Yes, your listeners are all used to memory palaces, I gather. Yes. But I didn't come at it from the ancient Greek. I came at it from memory palaces from Aboriginal cultures. So basically an Indigenous culture, but let's look at Aboriginal, who are still mobile. They're not nomadic. They don't wander everywhere. They move between locations. At each location, they know their landscape backwards. And we're talking 800 kilometres of landscapes being mapped for the Anuit people all sung, and what they do is go from location to location, just like a memory palace, and at each location they perform something, and I'll talk about performance in terms of memory later, but at each location they perform something. So they're not only singing the landscape for navigation, each location they sing or perform information about where water holes can be found, who's related to who, the behaviour of all the animals, birds, plants, everything. So it acts as a massive memory palace. But what my thinking was is what happens when they start to settle, when a culture starts to settle. And I went to Stonehenge, my husband's an archaeologist, I went to Stonehenge with no interest in archaeology, but thought, hang on, these people have just started to settle. If they lose all that information stored in the landscape, then they've lost all the critical survival information. We're not talking wooey stuff, we're talking pragmatic stuff, including all their medicine, and there's a lot of it that they store. So I thought, beauty, very clever. What they've done is represented that landscape palace locally with a circle of stones. And that's why you find them all over the world as posts or stones, depending on what the local materials available. So in America at Poverty Point, for example, in Louisiana, you have the same thing done in posts. In British Neolithic, they do posts and stones. So they're in Africa, they're everywhere, because this is a really good way, a memory palace of storing information. And then once they're past that settlement and things start to change, they just abandon all these sites. So you only find them in that transitional period. That's so interesting. So from an outsider's point of view, an early anthropologist probably just thought they were arbitrary dances and ceremonies, but you're saying some of them anyways had very specific cultural and memory-based storytelling and meaning and history and medicine. 
absolutely, you'll find that in every Indigenous culture all over the world. And as Nungarai said, I don't know what your language, <laughs> I'll use Aboriginal language, but Nungarai Wulpuri colleague who was helping with this said, the elders were pragmatic old buggers. We wouldn't have survived if they weren't. In Australia, buggers are sort of codgers that are dogmatic, but it's not a rude word. Got it. <laughs> so Aboriginal people use it a lot. And if you listen to their stories from their perspective, they don't mention gods, neither to the Native American or anything. They talk about the ancestors whose stories they tell because stories encode information. Got it. Yeah, I mean, you'd have to be practical to survive in less convenient times than modern day history. You mess up one little thing and you have no food. You have no way to heal yourself. You Absolutely. And there's lots of great studies I could waffle on for hours about the good studies, especially from the Pueblo, Native American Pueblo in New Mexico. But also our Australian cultures go back 60,000 years and there is absolutely convincing, compelling evidence that some of these stories date back that long to landscape changes and astronomical events and have been recorded accurately for 60,000 years. And the methods they're using are the methods that I've written about in my doctorate and then books. Wow, that's amazing. So we need to get to how to apply them in <laughs> contemporary life. Exactly. And I know in our earlier conversations, you said anything medical, just go to Mullen memory, which is great because uh, <laughs> Alex Mullen and Kathy Chen were on episode two and three of this show. So they were early uh, guests that we got to learn from and give some basic memory palace examples and techniques. And we've had so many guests do that since then. But some of the techniques that you have written about and studied are vastly different than anything that we are used to hearing about from like the Western uh, Europe and American memory championships, the techniques they use. So I'd really like to explore some of those and maybe try to find ways to implement them into medical studies. Yes. Well, Indigenous cultures aim in memorizing is for permanency. So they're using memory palaces, but they're also using a whole lot of other things and they're not after speed. So they incorporate other methods. So the primary methods that my field is called orality, O-R-A-L-I-T-Y. Now, you often hear that these cultures don't have writing. What does matter is what they do have, and they have to memorise vast amounts of information. We're talking a 1,000 plants probably and their properties and medical uses, and a lot of these have then been adapted for contemporary medicine. We're talking a 1,000 animals because they include all the, plant, all the invertebrates. So you've got a study from the Navajo in America of 700 insects and other invertebrates fully classified, all stored in memory. So their techniques use particularly song, dance, narrative, story and characters. And the use of characters is hugely important. You'll find that with memory champions, we use them for cards, giving them all characters, or numbers, giving them all characters. Indigenous cultures do it for everything. So the Pueblo people have 250 kachina, who are their characters that they use to tell all these stories. So by adding those in slowly at any particular location or even without locations, you will add a lot. So if you sing something, I mean, how many songs get stuck in your head? Oh, every commercial and little jingle on the radio. Exactly. So instead of the commercial or I love you, I love you, I can't live without you type songs, encode any knowledge you want to record and sing it. And I do that for the countries of the world. I've got them all in a memory palace in population order, starting from China, India. And my brain start goes straight to the memory palace. But I sing Africa and I sing the Caribbean, or you call it Caribbean, don't you? But I sing <laughs> and I sing the Balkans. I even know where the countries are in the Balkans. So song is incredibly useful. Dance, if you move, it doesn't have to be great dancing. If you move, it makes it more memorable. And there's studies of people with quite advanced dementia that are not responding to anything else, play them familiar music and they will respond or take them to a familiar place. And the neuroscience, I'm working with a neuroscientist here in Australia, but the neuroscience, especially the recent plasticity stuff, talks about the fact that music and place are recorded way down in the memory systems, hippocampus and on. So these are really powerful methods. So adding character to any story. So the Greeks, 
Grammatica. You know, they gave character. And you hear that Indigenous cultures think the stones are alive. It's more they give them character, just like um, the ancient Greeks did to constellations in the sky, because characters tell stories, make them memorable. I see. Okay, so this kind of sounds similar to some of the medical third-party companies out there that are making these sort of visual mnemonics and creating a story to them. But I've found in the past that sometimes it's hard for me to remember the story that someone else made. Maybe it wasn't made in a way that I can relate to. So is there anything stating that maybe making your own story is better, stronger, anything along those lines? Absolutely. When I'm working in, in schools, I don't give them my story. I have them make their own because your own memory palace and your own stories are much more memorable and you will bring in characters that that mean a lot to you because an emotional response makes a big difference. So you'll hear Native Americans or Australian Aboriginal singing their song lines in Native American they call pilgrimage paths. Their memory palaces in the landscape. They will just name each location and get tears in their eyes because in their minds the stories are coming back. So, yes, You've got to have a personal emotional reaction. You will have much stronger memory. So I don't use anybody else's stories. So this is an interesting concept of the storytelling and song singing and even dancing. I'm not entirely sure. How do you put a song or a dance in your memory palace? If it's, I can imagine it more while tribes are physically walking around to different locations, but if you have maybe your mental memory palace is your house or your school or local library, do you still place a song in there or how does that work? Some of them I do. A lot of the songs are not to do with a memory palace specifically, although I will sing a palace. I think it's time for me to introduce the handheld devices but because that gives an, a specific example that I do that. Usually I'll use a song as an ancillary or for something that I don't need the palace if it's just a little thing that I want to record and particularly, for example, for definitions. So let's take an example that we used in schools, in a primary school, but it'll work for definitions for anything, is the word force. Now, force in science has a very specific purpose. So all the kids, a rural school, so we had little kids up to year six, you know, you call them primary, elementary school. Yeah. Uh, So they'd done force in science. A week later, I interviewed every child in the school and I said, Do you remember doing force in science? To put in context, what is a force? Three out of 70 told me that it was a push or a pull. Another half of them said that it was when mum or dad or teachers make you do something you don't want to do. And the rest said, may the force be with you. (laughs) Which is great for their promotion, lousy science. So the music teacher got the... Um, Imperial March from Star Wars and taught them all the force is a push or a pull. And I'm doing the actions because you can't not do the actions. Force is a push or a pull, push or pull. They sang it in music, nothing else. Listen to them. I quizzed them all exactly the same wording. A week later, 70 out of 70 told me it was a push or pull, did the actions and started laughing. The thing is that that definition, when they didn't have that definition for, firmly, every time the teacher said force, They did not know what the teacher was talking about. So little songs for definitions are really valuable. I wouldn't wouldn't put that in a memory palace. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, I think so. Medical students use a lot of acronyms in their mnemonics. They're very common, have been for decades, but they're also sometimes not the most graphic or representative mnemonic you can use. So maybe implementing something like a little song real quick. B, I don't know. There's probably (laughs) ways to dance them. Yes, well, let me give you an example, but before I do that, I need to tell you about handheld devices because these are really useful and I don't know what your rules are on exams, whether you can take objects in as good luck charms. Anyway, we'll talk about a whole lot of objects. Indigenous cultures not only use the landscape, they use a lot of handheld objects. So what I'm holding up now, which is really good on an audio, isn't it, to have props? Oh, yes. This is a 100-year-old food device from Aboriginal culture. So what can you see? It looks like... A giant plate for a piece of corn. (laughs) Oh, right. Yes. So it is a food plate there. But if you look at the back, there's a whole lot of burnt on markings, yes, which are sort of structured, but you certainly couldn't read anything from them because they, they don't have a shape. That is a memory device that a girl would be given quite young when she starts collecting food 
because they're moving, they move between locations. Most cases, some cultures stayed put, but the majority, certainly up north, moved. So they carried as little as possible and they touch each item and have a song or dance or knowledge associated with it, which they're tested on and they go over and over all their life. But an easier one to replicate comes from the African Luba people. I talked about this in Memory Code and I get more questions about this than anything else because people have started implementing and finding them extraordinary. So what can you say now? Uh, that's got to be the Lukasa board. It, I think that's what I just interviewed Daniel yeah. Kiloff recently, and he mentioned the Lukasa board, which that's I had never exactly heard about or is. seen before. I'm guessing that's what this is. It looks kind of like a an intricate board game. Yeah. Okay. And it's got patterning on the back like a tortoise shell. And it's basically a board of beads and shells and carvings. And I, when I read about all this stuff that they could encode huge amounts of information to this bit of wood with beads and shells on it, I frankly didn't believe the research. I am a foundation member of the Australian Skeptics. I'm a hardcore scientist. This sounded like rubbish to me. There were none in Australia. This one I've had made for me from models. I finally held one in America. But I decided to test it. And so what I did was I grabbed a bit of wood from the veranda. They were making a new veranda rectangular bit of wood which i'm now showing you and just glued beads and shells on it that's kind of like the size of a brick with a bunch of yep. beads and shells glued to one side of it that's exactly right so started encoding a field guide to the victorian birds victoria is the state i live in and there's 412 birds so i started encoding just by copying what i know they do with the lucasa and our aboriginal people lucasa by the way is l-u-k-a-s-a Sometimes people want to look them up and there's lots on the internet about them. And our Aboriginal people use a Chiringa. Don't worry about that, but they use exactly the same. So the same methods is used, are used all over the world because it's the way the brain works. So I start encoding by touching the very top bead and encoding the very first family in the field guide, which is Dromaeidae, the emu. And so Dromae, they're all their days. So I had to get Dromae in my head. Drum roll, okay, that's fine, easy for the first one. The second one, I'm not doing the whole lot, by the way, in case you're worrying. <laughs> the second one, I don't think you can see that properly there, but it's a, a little bead, a greenish bead, and it's got two flecks on it. So in my head, one of those flecks is a wagging duck tail, and the other fleck is a gnat. Ducks are a gnat day, and I've now got 16 ducks to encode to that bead, which I did by using a story. And the story, the first duck is the magpie goose, and magpies is one of our football teams. We play proper football, not American rules type football, proper Australian football. <laughs> one of our teams, the magpies. Further down, you've got the swan. Swans are another team. So I made it a football match where they, it gets violent. The Australasian shoveler, which is one of the ducks, buries all the dead and so on. So that 16 ducks are in a story. It was easy to do. I encoded the whole 412 birds to that and started layering. I am astounded how well that works. And it's handheld. You can take it anywhere. I've had so many people now copying it in memory craft. I explain it in a lot more detail because everybody wants to use it. It is absolutely astounding. But what the beauty of using these objects or memory palaces the way Indigenous cultures do is you then layer information. So once I've got all the birds down there, I can start layering details of their behaviour. So if you did that for, say, anatomy, you'd then layer and layer and layer using the stories and songs and dances, and it works unbelievably. I've done one for spider families, which I just drew on a board. That works, but it doesn't work as well as one that's tactile. Okay. I was going to ask exactly that because it sounds like you have this little brick-shaped board with a couple of dozen beads on it, and you've used a few dozen actual physical beads and shells to remember over 400 birds, then that does sound like something you could easily use for maybe anatomy where there's several hundred bones. And then yes. maybe the next level would be the vessels that are associated with each section of the body or the muscle that attaches to each bone or the nerves in that area. So it really seems like you could fit an entire anatomy class on one or two of these Lucaso boards. Yes. One of the readers of Memory Code did it as a set of 10 of them that she linked together, not for anatomy, for another topic. 
But, yes, I've actually got 82 families there. And, yes, some of them are small and some of them are large. But that tactile, so, for example, Manura Day, which is our lyre bird, I dribble glue down the side by accident. I'm really bad at craft. Men day, so that's now a man urinating down the side of my memory board. You will always find something if you let your imagination go wild. And it is astounding how effective it is. It's just a memory palace in miniature. Wow, that's amazing. And you say that works much better than drawing something out. I know a lot of instructors will say, if nothing else, once you've created a memory palace, draw it out. I recommend that too. So that way, if you forget something, at least there's a record of it. Yeah, but when you draw it, don't use words. So mind maps are often recommended, but they use words in them. Now, I don't know about you, but I can copy words with no understanding. I can write notes from a page working out what I'm having for dinner. But if you have to do what's called a mode shift, you've got to change those words into images. So Indigenous cultures use art a lot. But I'm going to get on to medieval methods too. If you have to convert that into images... You've got to concentrate and focus. And your brain has to use two different concepts to make the images as a memory thing, such as just drawing the memory board for the spiders. And that makes a big difference. So if you then look at medieval and early Asian memory techniques, so let's start with medieval manuscripts. You know how they're all elaborate and drawing because the manuscript books were so rare that they had to be memorable because if you took notes on a slate, you had to wipe it off and do it again. So they would put fancy letters, but each one was different. They would reduce everything to a small little paragraph, which is why the Bible was done in little verses because it's much more memorable. They would grid things because you know how if you've read a book and you want to go back and find it, you'll often remember what position in the page it was. Mm -hmm. So why not use that, gridding it and making it all look different? They would do funny little images around the side called drolleries, which were often vulgar or violent because vulgar and violent is much more memorable than anything else. Uh, They would leave margins so that they would annotate as they were going. Anything to make them focus on that page and make it memorable. Does that make sense? Don't type notes. They're not memorable. No, words don't stick out to me when I'm reading them or writing them. And I know the spatial aspect of memory always helped me more when I had when I looked at my notes. I could remember what page it was on the right side, left side, top, bottom, middle. So that part really makes a lot of sense. I guess it makes me wonder, is there a good technique for maybe translating our multiple medical textbooks that we need to like go through into a more memorable format? Well, if you do it the medieval way, yes, it would just make them more memorable. But they, you know, as I said, they added all sorts of vulgarities and things. But of course, if the student adds them themselves, like making puns on the words, then they're going to do much better by scribbling down the side. So when they do notes, make sure to leave great big margins, lots of coloured pens, a vulgar violet mind, which I'm not recommending because I'm a mature age woman, and that will help a lot. There's other techniques they use too, like visual alphabets. So you've probably heard of the the peg system, one sun, two shoe, three tree. Mm -hmm. Yep. You get seven heaven and 11. What are you going to do when you get to 11? But there are ways around that. If you do that as an alphabet and associate animals with it, In memory craft, I've combined a number of medieval methods and made each of the animals or characters interact so that that gives you a sequence. So, for example, A is Arachne, the goddess of spider, spider goddess who throws her web over B, which is a bird of paradise, a great long tail and stuff, who's being attacked by a cat, who's being burnt by a dragon, who's also burning an eagle and so on. That sequence of images, you don't actually have to keep going back to the letter because images can run parallel to thinking words. So that works really well, and I use that for all public speaking. I use that. I also use a bestiary. The bestiary in medieval times were books of beasts, and these are not in sequence, but those beasts were designed to memorise virtues and vices, which we're not interested in anymore. But if you use beasts or animals to add to add the thing is to take abstract concepts and give them character so there's some of the medieval methods that work really well 
Okay, so the the visual alphabet actually reminds me of like the major method, but instead of changing numbers into letters and then making words and sentences with it for easier remembering of long strings of numbers, you're actually creating an entire story because each number or each letter in the alphabet has an image and then the images interact. Yes, that works really well. One of the examples from medieval is the Zodiac was used as a memory device and they've got all of that all interacting. So I pinched that and adjusted it for contemporary times. So yes, I don't use it for numbers. I use the Dominic system for numbers because characters work better for me. So for each of 00 to 99, I have a character and I use them all the time um, interacting. Those 99 or 100 characters, because I've got 00, those 100 characters are really good. But I tried to use somebody else's characters and they just didn't. I tried to use Dominic O'Brien's who was helping me and didn't work for me. I had to do my own. Mm. But I did put family in at one stage and then when you're working at speed, your brain automatically does things violent or horrible. So the family got kicked out again because I didn't like it. So I put in people I don't like. That's fun. <laughs> I've had a, a similar issue before having family member in, in that type of system. Yeah, your brain goes to places that you probably don't want to imagine your family members. <laughs> exactly. I had a granddaughter <laughs> in there. No, absolutely not. The other thing with medical, the Indigenous cultures use objects, small objects, and act out stories on little stages. You know, you've probably heard of medicine bags where the Native American had a bag of objects. And they're and Africans, they're used in different ways. Sometimes they're used to represent different diseases and so they go through, use them as a memory aid and go through the analysis that way. But And they don't use medicine bags for other things as well. But one of the African cultures uses them as a sequence of questions to eliminate. So the questions the healer would ask the patient, he uses a memory bag of, of all different objects, places them out, and each one reminds him of the questions to work on a process of elimination for diagnosis. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, So I don't know how much their health system and in, in medicine translates to Western medicine, so I'm not sure if a direct correlate could be made. But for instance, if they have all of these hundreds of herbs that they're using for different medicinal purposes, how do they remember which ones do which, which ones to be aware of? That seems like something that we could translate into maybe our pharmacology class. Yeah, they do use those. They also do all the physical breaks, how to treat a break. There's a lot of African evidence on analysing mental illness and recommending things like sleep. And they recommended potassium holding herbs for certain things that potassium is useful for. So a lot of traditional medicine has just become Western medicine. What's left is the other stuff, mostly. Uh, So, yes, they had special healers who would just memorise all this stuff using memory palaces again, but also using objects and using song, dance. So they'd use the combination and characters, the combination of all these things to memorise which plants worked on which. And some of them, they're now in Australia, the medical people are going to these traditional techniques and examining them from a Western science point of view and finding all sorts of properties in plants that they were unaware of before. Wow. So when we're discussing the different types of techniques that you can use, do you see a lot of mistakes that maybe learners make when they're starting off with them or any ways to be aware of obstacles and maybe not make those mistakes when they're learning these on their own? These methods can be so powerful that it's a good idea to make sure you get it right the first time. So I've got the countries in the world I'm pointing outside. I tend to use big landscape memory palaces rather than the rooms in the house. I don't find them as useful when I've got 10 locations in the room, which I do use, because there's not enough to layer. So that's fine if you're doing something simple, but if you want to layer information, so then you're better off big palaces. So, for example, I put Samoa, I was doing the countries, Samoa into the fruit shop by mistake when it should have been in the butcher four doors down. And so for a year I had to have Sam walking out of the fruit shop saying, no, you've got it wrong. I'm down here, out of the fruit shop and down and into the butcher. So you don't want to get it wrong at the beginning 
but now I'm doing languages, French and Chinese, I, because my memory, natural memory is so bad, languages at school were hopeless. I failed every year. But now I'm using a combination of all these techniques. I'm loving French, so I decided to take on Mandarin as well. You may as well go berserk. And I'm using big memory palaces for those and layering. So for Chinese, it's based on the radicals, um, a little portion of the characters. So each house is only one radical. And then I can layer more and more words and information because in a house, there's a whole lot of windows and bricks and walls and all sorts of things. So one thing I would recommend, if you want to start layering information, use bigger memory palaces. Good call. Okay. Yeah, that's something that's been brought up a few times in the past is if you run out of space or you know, you get too cramped in one location, then what are you supposed to do? And I guess there are a few ways to overcome that, but if you plan it maybe a little better initially, you won't run into that obstacle. Yeah, well, I have to do my walking every day. I'm people in their 60s who don't exercise are in trouble. And so I just incorporate my memorizing before I go anywhere. I decide what I'm going to memorize that day or what I'm going to revise and do that walk. And um, so I'm incorporating physical and mental exercise at the same time or singing, preferably not too loudly. And so I've set my Chinese memory palace is five kilometers. I don't do it all. I do do five kilometers each day, but I might do one bit over and over. I might do anything, but yeah, you just map it out. I've got 10 kilometers in total of Castle May where I live mapped out as memory palaces now. Wow. Okay. So like every couple hundred feet or something, you have a spot with a couple of mnemonics that are associated with different words. So every house, every fifth one, I make sure is a road. The Greek and Roman recommendation that every fifth should be something so you, you can make sure you, you've got everything in between. So I make every fifth one a road or a lane or something, which sometimes means leaving out a house or making a house and garden be two. But yes, so each house or property or shop or fence or anything, I just map them out and off I go. And it's really fun mapping them out. I tend to photograph them as I go just to so that I've got the list to, to work from, but I don't use that much. I go walking. I think I would use uh, probably Google Maps because I don't want people to think I'm stalking or trying to run their house. <laughs> that happened to me. I was putting in on oh, my history walk. I've got all of history and prehistory. Start at the front gate at two and a half thousand million years ago and walk around the block and then right around the block for history. I was at the back of a school putting in Henry VIII and Great Zimbabwe and all this stuff. And a woman said to me, excuse me, we keep seeing you behind the bushes at the back of the school. You know, So I explained what I was doing and she started doing her own history one. But where I was putting the ancient mire in, a guy came out of the unit and said, excuse me, what are you doing? Because I'm standing there staring at his unit with a clipboard. I said, oh, I'm doing memory pals with the ancient mire. And he just disappeared and closed the door very quickly. <laughs> Wanted nothing more to do with the old nutter. Yes, so that works. But look, it's great fun. The trouble is I can't walk down the street now without all these characters jumping out and wanting to talk to me. And sometimes I just say, shut up, the lot of you. I just want to go and get some milk. St. Augustine won't. The rest will obey. He jumps out from his lamppost every time. But he wrote about memory palaces and what it's like to walk through a memory palace where everything's, tr everything's trying to grab your attention at once and you have to say, no, that's what I want. And this is what happens when you layer information you end up with so much, you've got to just pull out what you want. And because he wrote about that, he refuses to obey his own rules. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I kind of wish I had that. I My current techniques are probably not that developed and I just don't practice as much as I should. But I think that would be kind of fun to walk down the street and have these stories jumping out at you. Well, if you do your exercise with your palaces, it's the way it works. And it makes me exercise too. That's good too. I like it. Good way to utilize the time. Uh, two birds, one stone kind of thing. Absolutely. So I recently changed up the ending question. Uh, every couple of dozen episodes, I like to mix it up a little bit. So you're going to be the first one with this new test question. Oh dear. <laughs> so it's, if there's one thing that you could do, if you went back in time and changed it, one thing that you would change if you could go back in time, what would it be? 
I want to know about these before I started teaching many long years ago. I did use some things like when I taught um, electronics, I would give the electrons and everything characters and they were carrying jewels in vaults. You know, it all worked, but I only did it a little bit. I would use these much, much more and maybe I would have passed languages at school. (laughs) Agreed. Yeah, at high school, there's a lot more time to play around with these types of things, less strenuous uh, curriculum. They sound time consuming, but in fact, because you're memorizing more, but in fact, they're actually much less time consuming because the effectiveness and efficiency is actually much more. Plus, it's more fun making up the stories. And so when I'm cooking or sharing or anything else, I'm forever making up stories and interacting with my characters. And in Indigenous cultures, the characters will morph. So, for example, I'm here on Jajawarin country in Australia and the, the chief character is Bunjil, the wedge-tailed eagle. And you'll see in their stories he morphs between being an eagle and being a human-type character. And you'll find that in all of them, they morph between whether you're talking to them as a character or whether they're encoding the behaviour. And my, I'm finding this is happening all the time. The more I play around with my characters the more they're morphing between multiple purposes. Wow. It sounds like an interesting study for neuroplasticity later on too. Oh, wire up my head. Off you go. (laughs) (laughs) Are there any uh, resources that you recommend for students that want to learn more about these? Uh, My latest book is Memory Craft. I am, to the best of my knowledge, the only person who has pulled in all these Indigenous stuff. And that's why I'm getting such a strong reaction from the Aboriginal cultures, we've got over 300 of them here in Australia, because I'm looking at their intellectual achievements, and that's usually just been neglected. So I don't know of anyone else that has. On my website, there's a bibliography of the 800 plus resources I used for the doctorate that was published by Cambridge University Press then, and then for the recent books. So, and that's categorised. So there's all 800 academic papers and books and things there. That's great. I actually already had that list. I definitely wanted to add that in the uh, show notes. And that's Lynn Kelly, L-Y-N-N-E-K-E-L-L-Y.com.au. Yep. And any last minute shout outs to students or thoughts? Uh, Studying's wonderful, which is why I went back to uni as an, in my late 50s, and I will now study for the rest of my life. I'm studying everything I can because it's just good fun when you're using these techniques. It's no longer a chore. And everyone in medicine knows they have to be lifelong learners, so might as well start implementing some of these. Yeah, and then if they could please start nagging everyone to start implementing them at primary school. Have you noticed little kids, we sing the information, they dance, they tell stories, and then when they get to about grade three, They stop. Plus, there's a thing, you know, put away your toys, we're going to work now. In the primary schools I've been working in, they say, get out your toys, we're going to work now, because we use their toys as our characters. We call them rapscallions. So we use their toys as their characters to act out spelling and act out maths tables and all sorts of things. So don't ever put your toys away. That's great. We could raise a next generation of geniuses if we started this off early. Or people who enjoy learning will do for me. (laughs) (laughs) Well, Lynn Kelly, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been so much great, useful information. It's been an absolute pleasure, Chase. We hope you enjoyed this episode. For links to connect to us, email us, or for previous episodes, please see the show notes. We'd also love to hear from you. So please send an email or join us on the Medical Anemonist Mastermind Facebook group. Any ideas, tips, tricks, people that you'd like to hear interviewed, we'd love to hear it. Any advice to make the show better and more enjoyable would be greatly appreciated.